think about it for a moment. You know, compared to maybe what the rest of your week has had, just to be together and to be so richly blessed. The, the blessings of our common salvation. I mean, do you remember what it was like when you first had your sins washed away? Think about that for a moment. One day, maybe you were wrestling with guilt, you were wrestling with eternity, you were wrestling with your relationship with God, you experienced salvation, and, and what a sense of relief that was, what a sense of encouragement, what a sense of blessing it was. It's good to be together with people who love the Lord. It's good to be together with people who have a common goal to be more like the Lord and, and to be with the Lord and to share in the blessings of the common salvation. To know that we have freedom from sin and from guilt. Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So once we stood condemned and once we had no hope, once we were alienated from God, but being together, it's good. There's a lot in the world that's not good, amen? There's a lot in the world that brings us down, that's troublesome, that's painful. But being with the Lord and being with His people, being forgiven, being cared for, being loved, and being able to be with a church family that, that loves you, not, not everyone has that. Bruce emailed me an article about the nuns. Uh, not the ones that were a habit, uh, but the N-O-N-E. Uh, the people who, on the census, have checked off that they don't have a religious affiliation. And that's now the fastest growing in Bruce. I think it was from Time Magazine. And I had, I've read several of these articles. The last few years, a lot of people are talking about this group of people on the Census Bureau. When it comes to what's your religious affiliation, they check none. They're, they have no affiliation. They, they don't enjoy the, the blessings that we have of a common salvation and of, of being able to worship together, of being able to spend time together. Let, let me show a quick video uh, that's in conjunction with this idea. I hope this works better than the SpongeBob. There's a major shift going on across the country when it comes to people who say they identify with the religion. KZI 9 News reporter Jennifer Richardson is live in the studio with local opinion about why a group called The Nun is on the rise. Jennifer? People who claim no affiliation are the nuns. This doesn't necessarily mean they don't believe in God or aren't spiritual. Proof of this shift comes from the Pew Forum of Religion and Public Life, who conducted a survey about religion. Local pastors and Eugene residents are all weighing in. Every 15 minutes, the First Christian Church's bells fill downtown Eugene. And when we hear them, a connection to religion is often made. But it seems for many, those connections are fading. This is something that I think probably most pastors are very aware of. We come up across with them. You know, there's been a, a general decline in church attendance across the board uh, in just almost all denominations. Pastor Dan Bryant's sanctuary has been around for more than a century. This decline he speaks of is now documented in the millions. The Pew Research Group found one in five people, that's nearly 20% of the population, claim no religious identity. One in three are younger than 30 and likely won't ever claim a religion. I'm Jewish and so I associate myself with Judaism, but it's not a huge part of my daily life. Personally, I don't affiliate with any religion, um, not because I don't believe in anything. I was raised Catholic, so I have that identity with me, and that's something I'll always carry. It means that we have to be more creative, and we have to be more nimble. For Bryant, that means an interfaith service every month, increased community service, and two very different Sunday worship services. A couple of blocks away, the Eugene Faith Center also appealing to a non-affiliated crowd. This is a very spiritual community, but very, we think, kind of hostile to our organized religion. Here, there's no stained glass, crosses, but at the same time, a 
renewed sense of spirituality. I think our identity is our is our community life together. So whether it's a generational shift or simply skepticism, even if the new norm becomes a foundation of faith without labels, just like clockwork, bells will continue to chime. The survey also states the United States remains a highly religious country in comparison to other advanced democracies. Live in studio, Jennifer Richardson, KEZI 9 News. Wow, so we'd like to think of America as a religious country, um, but we have this rise of people who claim no religious affiliation. Wouldn't it be great though? Wouldn't it be great if more people could experience the common salvation that we enjoy, the, the blessings of being a believer? Wouldn't it be incredible to be able to be like the first Christians on the day of Pentecost? You know, the Spirit comes, tongues of fire, uh, it's a mighty rushing wind, people experience this great movement of God, and then all of a sudden the church is on fire. Would that not be an awesome experience? And, and as I watch what I see in Scripture, and actually, it's like the church just happened. This happened, you know, just like wildfire, just spread it. And it looks so easy the way that they do it. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, and let's look at what Clay read. They, they make it look just like falling off a log, just like it's so natural. It just happens, right? Uh, in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches that huge sermon. Uh, the people are looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. They're looking forward, and Peter says he came, crucified. And, and they're, they're really convicted in their hearts, and, and they feel bad, and, and they ask, what do we need to do? In verse 37, they hear the sermon, that, well, what do we need to do? And Peter says in 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, he, you know, he concludes, and, and, and he continues to exhort them. And, and verse 42, this group of people who had heard this powerful sermon at Pentecost, who have uh, become believers in Christ now, uh, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together. They had all things in common. They're selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had needed. Day by day, look at that lifestyle, daily, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So what is it that they're devoted to? Look at this carefully. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So obviously the apostles are gathered around. They're probably meeting in the temple courts. And they're teaching them the truths that they had learned from Jesus. They're teaching them all about the kingdom. They're teaching them about God's will. They're teaching them about submission. They're teaching them about love. They're teaching them the golden rule. They're, they're teaching this. And so the people are devoted to that teaching. They're following that. They don't have the New Testament written yet, so obviously they're looking at the Old Testament for Scripture. They don't have a New Testament yet. And they're devoted to what the apostles, those close followers of Jesus, are teaching. And they're also devoted, it says, to the fellowship. Drinking coffee and eating donuts is very biblical, right? Uh, having a backyard barbecue. They probably had a lot of pulled pork. No, they wouldn't have. Probably not at that point yet. Um, but they enjoyed spending time together. You're building your spiritual foundation through the apostles' teaching. You're right? They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. But that's not going to keep you connected in the kingdom. It's the fellowship. There's the glue. That's what bonds them together. They have a spiritual foundation so that they can live a godly life. But you can't do that by yourself. They're devoted to each other, the fellowship, having things in common, being together so that they can encourage each other, so that they can grow together, they can keep each other accountable together, they can keep each other 
uh, focused on Christ together, and, and they're just being built up more than just intellectually, but they're also building their hearts up. And they're devoted to that. And they're also devoted to the breaking of bread. They're having communion. They're the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, whatever term you want to call it. This group of people are devoted to that practice of however frequently they're doing it. And from the text, it seems like it's more than just Sunday. It's more than just once a week. It's part of the regular practice. They're breaking bread. They're drinking the cup. They're remembering the death, the burial, the resurrection, the, the physical body of Christ, the blood that is shed, and, and they are devoted to that. And then finally, uh, and the prayers. They're prayerful people because they recognize they live in a physical reality, but they are dependent on a spiritual, supernatural God. And so they're not trying to do everything on their own. They're not trying to do it by their own willpower. They're devoted to prayer. And in the midst of all this, there's a transition that they are offering. You know, the, the end of the passage says that the Lord is adding people daily. Day by day, people are coming into the kingdom. Day by day, people are entering in. And what is the transition that they are offering? A lot of times people think it's a new religion. Right? Right? Because here they are in the center of Judaism. They're in Jerusalem. That's where this is taking place. They're in the middle of all the temple worship and the Mosaic laws followed and people read the Torah. And, and so all of a sudden now they're following Christ and people think it's a new religion. Where are they still meeting? In the temple. What book are they still reading? The Law and the Prophets. Who are they meeting with? The same people. It's not a new Religion, but you're saying, but isn't Christianity different than Judaism? It's a new covenant. Why do I say that? Because it's still the same God. And I don't think they would have considered themselves a religion because religion is man's effort to reach God. So I definitely believe they would say we're ushering in and we're part of this new covenant. It is a transition away from legalism, right? The old law, if you uh, are circumcised as a male, and if you follow the real, the real rigorous rituals, it doesn't matter how you really live your life because you're a child of Abraham and, and you're going to be fine. So it's, it's a shift away from legalism. It's, to, it's a transition from the Mosaic law into the covenant of grace. And that's what they're experiencing here. And so the, the key word for me when I look at this passage is how do they help this transition to happen? And why are the people so excited about it? That one word, devoted. They were devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. So what does that word mean? <clears throat> devoted. Have you, thought, have you thought about the word devoted? It, it has something to do with I hear some whispering over there, Bruce. Mm -hmm. we, we got an insight to the word devoted? Yeah. Let's hear it. Got some notes. Uh, steadfastly attending to perseverance, continue all the time, continue. Continue all the time, continue. I like it. Very good. I, I wrote in my notes, it's about being faithful, committed, loyal, and determined to see something through. Determined to see it through. Uh, you said Mackenzie's going to run a marathon. She's going down to uh, Gulf Shores or Gulf Springs. Or Gulf, Gulf Shores, Alabama. Yeah. Gulf Shores, Alabama. You don't win a marathon. You don't finish a marathon if you're not devoted. Right? I couldn't, I couldn't run a marathon. I couldn't run from here to the car. But I couldn't run a marathon just because I wanted to or because I thought it was a good idea. Or because it looked fun, how do you win a marathon? Or at least finish one. You train for it. You prepare for it. You eat right. You sleep right. You plan for it. But none of that will come to fruition unless you're what? Devoted. And there's a lot of things in life. Uh, graduating college. Uh, your marriage won't survive. It will wilt. It will wither. It will shrivel up unless we're devoted to our spouses. So devotion isn't just about 
loving this idea or being in love with the idea or having willpower or wishing. It, it's, it's something that's active. It's about being all in. It's about 110% participation. So I think of devotion like this in, in an animal context. Devotion is more like your Labrador retriever than your cat. Dogs are faithful, right? They love you. Your cat, what? It comes out when it wants to be fed. You know? So think of devotion like a Labrador retriever. And devotion is an attitude. They had the attitude. They're devoted to this lifestyle. And attitudes are contagious. A good attitude, if you're in the workforce, if you're, if you're with a group of colleagues, and I don't care if you're in your cubicles or in your office or if you have a network, however it works, if someone has a great attitude, what happens? Man, we can do this. This is the best company to work for. Things are great. If you get someone in there that's got a burr under their saddle, what happens? The morale of the whole office does what? Takes a nosedive. So devotion is it's an attitude. Attitudes are contagious. And here, their attitude is very contagious. They make it look like it's so easy, though. This group of people, they just show up at the temple and, and everything just starts happening and it looks like they're on fire. And it, it, it is on fire. And why is that? I believe because they're on fire for God. They're devoted. They're committed. They're inspired. And probably on top of everything else, God is a very real presence in their mind. Think about our existence in the North American church. When is God real? Sunday mornings. We come in and we get a worship fix. Right? And we sing some good songs. Jonah, you did great. You know what I really like today? And you do this almost every time. The first and second song, you flow right together. It's seamless flow. It's so good. It's like, it's, it's a different song, but you're playing and all of a sudden it's like the next song. It's like, wow, man, that is really good. I know he has to practice that. So, we um, <laughs> come though, it, most of the time for us, when is God real? When, when we're singing an uplifting song or, or when someone like, you know, Bruce leads a great prayer this morning, gets us focused on, on God and how great he is and how we need to, you know, be in love with him. And then what happens Monday? Is God even on our radar? Or Tuesday? Or Wednesday? I love, you know, B.B. King passed away this week. And I cried at least five times that day when he died. I did. I'm a huge B.B. King. My dad turned me on to B.B. King before I even knew the alphabet, right? But he sings the song Stormy Monday. Do you know the song Stormy Monday? Mike knows it, yeah, right? Monday's bad. Tuesday is just as bad. Wednesday is even worse, right? I forget what Thursday is, but Friday, the eagle is going gonna, gonna to fly. And then Saturday, I go out and I play all night long. And Sunday morning, I come into church and I get down on my knees and I say, Lord, have mercy on my soul. It's a great song. If you've never heard it, you should YouTube video it. Uh, or internet it, as someone told me the other day, right? Instead of looking something up, I knew you. Internet it. Internet that song. It's really good. <laughs> the point is, though, when is God on our radar? Only one day a week, lots of times. For these people here, though, they're devoted, and it's day in and, and day out, and they've got this new life that they're living, and they're excited about it. And there are people on the on the fringe, <clears throat> and they're looking in. And, and they're seeing this group of people from a distance who are enjoying this life of the apostles' doctrine of, of fellowship, of, of breaking the bread and the prayers. And they see this attitude that they have. And, and they see the real life that they're living. And it's not a one day a week. It's not a, a seasonal thing. It's a real on-fire experience that is very, very attractive. And people come to them and they feel welcomed. <clears throat> and they feel accepted. And they feel loved. They feel needed. They feel useful. 
and daily they're, they're growing. So what's this mean for us? When we look at this passage, Acts chapter 2, what does it mean for us here today where, where we are, especially in a community that's already saturated with other churches? We could walk outside our door here and, and, and within just a couple minutes walk, there's several congregations. What does this mean for us? Well, number one, consider their devotion. That's, that's what pops in my mind. As, as I look here, they devoted themselves. And how powerful that word devoted is. And, and so I have, to, I have to ask myself, am I devoted like that? <coughs> that's a challenge. When I look at that, the question that comes up and the challenge that I personally feel like, I see how devoted they are. I have to ask myself, am I a devoted follower of Christ? And if you want to know where you are devoted, and I thought about this for a while this week, you really want to know where you're devoted, ask yourself one simple question. What am I most afraid of losing? I know a lot of people say, well, how do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? How do you spend your energy? That's not necessarily about devotion. That's about what you worship. <clears throat> if I want to know what I'm most devoted to, what is it that I'm most afraid of losing? Because that's where I'm most tied in. What am I most afraid of losing? And if you can answer that question in one sentence, what am I most afraid of losing? Then you'll know where you're really devoted. Now there's a lot of things we could be afraid of losing. Or people, or whatever. There's, there's a lot that could go in that category. I'm asking, what are you most afraid of losing? If you say, well, it's my relationship with God, then you know where you're devoted. What am I most afraid of losing? That, that shows what I'm most devoted to. The second thing that comes to my mind is, as I look at this idea of am I devoted, is my core message the same? And this is huge. You know, we look at the study uh, of the nuns. And, and we look at all these people who are, you know, signing off on, I don't believe in a faith or I'm not attached to a faith. And there are all these studies that are, that are being proliferated about why people are at arm's length from Christianity. And there's two or three big reasons why a lot of non-believers or marginal believers want nothing to do with the church. Number one, we're homophobic. This is what they're saying. We're homophobic. Uh, number two, we're judgmental. That's, that's all that Christians want to do is, is be judgmental. I, and I can't remember what the third one was. But those two are big enough right there. Uh, you know, that's, that's how the world perceives us. That's what, when, what, what is a Christian? Oh, well, those are the people who hate gay people and they're judgmental. Is that the core message of Christianity? I need to make sure I'm devoted, but I need to make sure that my message is on track with theirs. And then the message that Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost when the church takes off when it catches on fire is Jesus was the Messiah who was coming, and when he got here, sinful people crucified him. And when those sinful people, and it gives me goosebumps to think about it, when the sinful people recognize they're separate from God and they say to Peter, what must we do? There's an easy answer. Is that the same message that, that I have? I have to make sure that my core message isn't something that I plagiarize from Joel Oldstein. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, as a, as a body of believers, do we want a feel-good faith that makes false promises? Or do we have a core message that says, sinful man has crucified Jesus and you can be reconnected to him at the cross? You can repent of your sins. You can be immersed and join to that resurrection. You can have your sins forgiven. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit and, and be reconciled to God. Is, is that the core message? We need to make sure we stay on track with that. Um, do you guys remember the days, most of us in here are old enough to remember the days when it's a Kodak moment was a positive phrase. Remember that? Ooh, it's a Kodak. What did that mean? 
I'm asking, what did that mean? Taking a picture. Taking a picture, yeah. It used to be it was a memory worth saving. Now, when it comes to regards to the state of the North American church, some people are saying that Kodak moment, a Kodak moment, is not a positive phrase. And, and if our technology will cooperate one more time, there's a major shift going on across the country when it comes to people who the say they identify with a religion. KZI 90. Think of the idea of the, the phrase Kodak moment for a moment. Here we go. Okay. Some say it's as if the church has lost its way, has somehow lost its focus on its true mission. They said the same thing about Kodak as digital photography began to change the landscape. And I think we got confused as a bit of what, kind, what business we're in. Are we a chemical company? Are we a film company? Are we an imaging company? Uh, what are we? We didn't know what business we were. Yeah, we sort of we kept uh, vacillating about that. Today is not our day for technology. So here's a guy who's being interviewed. The church that he is in at one time had a big attendance in, and it's part of his experience with the nuns and part of people not being part of church anymore. And so the interviewer is saying, well, what's the mission of the church? And, and the pastor says, well, it's right on our letterhead. It's right on our bulletin. We've got it on the wall. Let me see if I can remember what it was. I can't remember. And I'm just going to go ahead and skip the rest of the video because it's, I don't know what's going on. Um, but here's this guy, and he's got this huge building, this huge church, and he doesn't even remember what his own mission is. Now, think about that for a moment. And, and hopefully this is going to click out of that and be ready for the next slide. We won't have to restart it like we did after SpongeBob. Think about it for a moment. What is the mission of the church? Guy says, well, I know what our mission is. Uh, we've got it written down. Uh, oh, we're going to make Christ visible, and, and he can't 
And then finally, at the end of the interview, he kind of sort of remembers what it is. I might be a little bit biased. I think, you know, I asked the question, what does this have to say to us, especially in a community that is saturated with other churches? I think we have something that's a little bit unique, a little bit special that, that, we, that we can offer. I like to think of New Song as a church where people can come in. We've got a rack back there behind the communion table, you know, that coat rack back there. I kind of like to think of that as a place where people could hang up their church masks and not have to come in and pretend like it's a perfect group of people. I think that's unique because I think a lot of church cultures, a lot of churches that I've been exposed to or maybe have even worked with have a persona that when we sit down, so perfect. My kids don't mess up. My kids don't make mistakes. And I don't make mistakes. I have a perfect marriage and I have everything right in my life and everything is always good and no one is ever sick and, and everything is right. And I'd like to think that we're different than that. I'd like to think this is a place where people who have been wounded by brokenness and by unhealthy churches come together. Maybe I'm biased though, but I think we have something unique. We can be ourselves. We can be accepted. When we started New Song, we wanted to be a non-judgmental community of believers. We could come together and have a heart for the downtown area and have a heart for people who wanted to be healed. I think we've done a wonderful job with that. And it's a great, great Experience. We also wanted to be a church where we offered a good biblical understanding of Scripture, but without the legalism that a lot of people will attach to that. We wanted to have a good view of Scripture and a good view of people, but not have a critical attitude like a lot of people will attach to Christianity. So, what do we enjoy? in do some that's unique to the religious landscape around us. Now, looking at this new group of believers in Acts 2, they're gathered together in this center of legalism, this temple courts, the influence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and, and they're ushering in this new covenant. And, and what is it that we have that's unique to our religious landscape? We enjoy fellowship. Spending time together, not just in these four walls, but outside this area. I also like the fact that we enjoy tolerance for other views of Scripture. We don't all see things as perfectly and accurately as I do here. <laughs> There's room for a little bit of deviance. Or, wait, that's probably the wrong term. I mean that the mathematical term. You can deviate from what? Man, not only does the technology stay today, uh, but we have a great experience to have that religious tolerance. You know, some places you have to agree to everything that everyone says to be welcome. And I love the fact that here, we come from different backgrounds, and we don't see things eye to eye, and that's not a test of fellowship. We can see things differently. We can disagree and still love each other. And I think that's unique. And I also enjoy being in this region, but being with this body and being free from legalism. That, I think, is something that's beautiful. We have love. We have unity. We have a heart for service. We're focused on the Bible, but we're so adaptable in the way that we can communicate Scripture here and understand Scripture. And we can communicate. We can reach people. And it's wonderful. So, I shared this lagging, sad video, which is stuck now. So, Joan, I don't know what we're going to do for the next talk. Because uh, it's not coming out of that right now. Uh, because this guy says, oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, what's the mission of our, uh, 
our, our church, oh, it's right on our letterhead. Well, we don't have letterhead with a mission statement on it. Uh, we don't have a mission statement um, that's painted on the wall or plastered everywhere. But I, I think that we have a common purpose. I think that's being a life-changing church that changes life. And so as you go through this week, don't let Monday detract from what you experience today. Don't let Tuesday become worse or Wednesday. Keep your focus and your purpose of, hey, I'm, I'm part of a group of people that want to be a life-changing church that changes lives. And I think when we experience that, we experience at least a spark of that fire that 